talk to them on the phones. Be sure to uh, give them our, our best for their anniversary. Any other anniversaries that there's not a bulletin? No, moving right along. Okay. Um, I guess that brings us to a short video that uh, Paul wants to present to us. You're on, Paul. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and again beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. You know, it doesn't say the rich man and the poor man and the rich man's house stayed and the poor man's house didn't. These are all probably the same structure, the same construction. You know, it's basically 
uh, rocks put together with a clay mortar and covered with a kind of a stucco thing and then whitewashed. They all the same. If you were to walk into either one of these homes, you'd think, wow, this is a nice home. But there's a big difference, isn't there? How many people know we're not talking about the construction of homes here? We're talking about people. Both the home builders built a religious structure. Both here and at least outwardly affirm truth. In fact, you can't see the foundation. And that's the point of the analogy. Both look the same. Both look impressive. Look like impressive religious structures. But there's a massive difference. One is built on the rock of sound doctrine, true repentance, and faith in Jesus Christ, salvation by grace alone. That's not only hearing the words, but doing the words, and living the word. The other is built on sand of hypocrisy, false religion, human works, and human religion. One builder did it the hard way. Remember the narrow gate, the narrow path, and the, and the, the, the small gate? It's hard to get through that. And not many people do it. But this man did, dug deep. He dug to bedrock. Deep repentance, deep and thorough understanding of the gospel and of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Today there are hundreds of thousands of people running around throwing the name of Jesus around and what does Jesus say? I never knew you at all. They have no real relationship with him because they are hearers and not doers. And you will not always know who's who. It's just like walking into the homes. If you don't see the, 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 the foundation, everybody looks the same. And that brings us to another thing is that you know, we're, we're, we don't have the tools to judge the other folks. And we're talking about people here in the, in the church. We're talking about, I mean, the people who don't hear the word, you know, Jesus is not talking to them. He's saying, you've heard the word and you're not paying attention and you're not doing what it what it's, says to do. You'll, always not, you'll not always know who's who. The rock, the house on the rock and the house on the sand look essentially the same, same place, same congregation. How do we know who the hypocrites are? Well, you're not really going to know until the storms of life come. And when the storm comes, the rain will fall, the streams will rise, the wind will blow. Those with a solid biblical understanding and who live like that will survive life's storms. We've witnessed... right here in our own church. People that have survived storms that without God's word could not and would not have made. And we thank God for those people. Something we want to emulate. It's an amazing thing. These people have rock solid biblical foundations that have carried them through the direst of personal storms. But you know these personal storms, as bad as they are, that's not really the storm that we want to prepare for. The storm that we want to prepare for is final judgment, for which every one of us, every one of us, will have to stand there and give an account of who we are and what we've done. Remember that old familiar hymn, On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. How do I know that's true? Because the Bible tells me so. Okay, that brings us to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, didn't mean to get devotion for you, on you. But that brings us to prayer and praise. And so... This is time, and I guess Nathan will bring the, uh, the microphone out. So anybody who has a special prayer that would like to uh, to have us pray for or praise, right here is, is David.
I have a praise once again. Um, a week ago, my son Tyler had to go to Poland. He works for the USO, and uh, he had to do a tour. He had to visit seven bases in a week, and it was pretty grueling. But he said everything went real well, and he's back home safely. Great. Good morning. It's so great to be back with my, my church family. Um, I would uh, ask a, a blessing for uh, Chris. He's still over in Hawaii. He's getting our house over there uh, ready and prepped for sale. Because um, we're bailing out of Hawaii and you guys are going to be stuck with us. So. <laughs> and that is crazy, I'll tell you. It was so great to get off that uh, plane. A week and a half ago in Missoula, it's the most beautiful mountains in the world. The snow yesterday, it's like, what was I doing in Hawaii? <laughs> so great to see you all, I love you all. A lot of you have been praying for Paul Peck. I just got an update on him. He is, he's getting a whole lot better. His voice is getting stronger, he can preach better, and uh, they took a recent CAT scan of the, his throat and neck area where the cancer was taken out, and they said it's amazing how the recovery is going on. And uh, I think this last couple weeks he was going to have that tracheal tube taken out here in Missoula, so he said he's getting tired of fussing with that, so he's well enough to, to go back to normal. So that's a praise the Lord. Amen. Anyone else? I would, I would put my wife on the prayer list. She has a, a dental appointment tomorrow, and she's not feeling real well. in Ohio who attends a very small church and they're getting ready to plant their church in a, right across the street from a, a brand new subdivision full of young couples and young children, obviously many who probably need to know the Lord. And so I just pray for them. Um, I can't think of the name of the church right now, but God knows it. Um, it's just that they would be effective and that their ministry would flourish all in Jesus' name. While I'm doing this, I think, you know, one of the things we have, Paul's here with us today, and, and also Bruce the pastor, lift up our pastors, it's a spiritual warfare. Probably nobody hardly knows him, maybe uh, Bruce, but uh, John Gorman, he was stayed with us for a while, him and his wife and kids are ministering in Colorado to the military bases there. And he's got quite a ministry going there, and uh, we need to pray for him and his ministry. So we keep in contact with him about once a year. You know? So anyway, pray for John Gorman and his ministry. Okay. Any others? Come on. Somebody go, oh, oh you're on this side. You're supposed to wait until Nathan comes all over here. I have a friend in Missouri recently had a head-on collision and she's currently in the hospital, both legs damaged. Um, and they just watched her heart for like an hour, like physically had her cut open to watch her heart. So just prayers for recovery there. What's her name? Morgan. Morgan. What Traveling. Tom and 
and also prayers for Ron and Jean and their ministry up in Alaska. It, it sounds like a daunting task that you guys have, but um, pray that people come beside you and uh, the Lord will open up paths for um, an awesome awakening for those folks up there. Anybody else? Okay, just a, just a quick word. You guys know that I've, I've been really hard on on pastors in our country here recently, right? Not not really getting to the bedrock of what we're all about here. But I gotta tell you, you gotta you should be really pleased to have the pastor that you have. Because he does, he does it the hard way. I read through the Bible in a year three times while we were going through John. He digs deep. And we appreciate it. Oh, Lord, here our prayers this morning, Lord. We just praise you for your grace and mercy, and we just ask for that to continue to come for us. Lord, we just praise you that uh, you were able to see Tyler through his, his trip through Bowling and through all those bases in a week and keep him safe and, uh, for what he does there. We do pray also, Lord, that you would just uh, watch over Chris while he's staying there in Hawaii and preparing to, to move permanently here with us. Uh, watch over Sandy as she's here by herself for, for a couple weeks and for her safe passage back as well. Lord, we praise you for, for the, what you've done with, with Paul Peck and we just pray with his, his, his cancer and uh, it, it just seems like he's doing so much better we thank you for that. It's a further example of prayers answered. And we just pray that you continue to be with him and with his doctors, that he would continue this, this progress. I would ask you to be with Fern. If she's uh, not feeling well, if she's going in for this dental appointment, we just pray that uh, you'll be with those, with those uh, folks that are be ministering to her and that she'll come out of that really well. You know, we've got another church that's trying to be planted there in Ohio. And it's for your ministry, for your praise, for your worship. And we just pray that you would just be with those folks that it actually becomes a, a, a working, viable, effective uh, bedrock ministry. Lord, we do praise, thank you for Pastor Bruce. What a wonderful servant you have in him. We thank you for those who serve in difficult areas, such as Ron and Jean do. And we just pray for their effectiveness. And we pray, for the Lord, that, uh, that you'll reach out to, to folks that can go out there and, and, and give them a helping hand. Pray that that happens for them. We pray that you'll be with uh, John Garman, who is working your ministry in, in these Colorado bases. Pray that you touch him and send your Holy Spirit over him and those others that, that he's, he's reaching out to. Lord, this young lady who's had the auto crash of uh, Morgan. We pray for her healing. We pray for the, to be with the, uh, the doctors and the, the vital skill that they have to be able to, to have her come to a full recovery. And Lord, we pray that you be with Tom and Debbie as they return from their trip, return to us. We just pray for, for travel mercies for, for them. We also want to pray especially for our Life Song International uh, mission and for the, the guy that's, that's leading that, uh, Dennis. They have a they have a tough road there in the Ukraine, Lord. Yes, with the war that's going on and the orphans that they're de dealing with and the mission that they have, and they they just got so many things going on. And we would just pray that you would just watch over them and and make them as effective as they can possibly be. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.
let's continue our worship. You can turn in your hymnal to 325 if you like. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Center up in Alaska. 
and they minister to the native community up there. And there is no community anywhere that needs the hope of Jesus Christ more than those folks. And they, I'll tell you what they need. They need finances. We've got the love offering out here. You have a chance today to help. Uh, they have a sign up if you want their newsletter. You catch them out there at the table and sign up for that. And they need people to help. If God puts it on your heart to participate in a short term or probably even a long term missionary effort, they need people that are handy with uh, hammers and nails and chainsaws and uh, I don't know, if you go at the right time of year, you can probably even help uh, Ron pack a moose out. So, but especially they need help for people who have a heart for working with youth. And when you hear the story up there, it'll move you. It moves me right now. And I told the folks at Sunday School, and I'm going to remind you, if God has laid it on your heart to, to uh, perhaps make a short-term missionary trip to help these folks out, and the only thing that's standing in your way is the expense of going to Alaska because it can be expensive, don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you. You talk to me, you talk to the church elders, and we're going to help you with it, okay? And they need prayer. They covet prayer. So please remember that. Fourteenth chapter of the book of Romans. We're going to look at the first three verses today. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, and a lot of us are old enough to remember that time, there was a very flamboyant and fiery radio preacher, and he became famous for his attacks on everything that he considered evil. Movies, racetracks, dancing, smoking, fluoride in the water system. He was a vehement anti-communist who once claimed that the United States had a moral responsibility to launch a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. He once denounced American Christians because they refused to rise up, they refused to rise up and stand against the temps to switch temperature measurements from Fahrenheit to Celsius. He claimed that that attempt was nothing but a sneaky communist plot to take over the world by degrees. <laughs> I apologize. I couldn't help it. Some of this man's fiercest criticism was directed at Christians who disagreed with him on any issue. And that is our lead-in to Romans chapter 14. The truth is, there are many areas of Scripture interpretation over which faithful, sincere believers can honestly differ. Differ, I'm sorry. Tragically, though, there have always been Christians who insist on dividing with other Christians over trivial issues. And I, I had, a, had a thought to experience in our church in Alaska. Sometimes it's not even biblical issues. Sometimes it can be the color of the carpets. They, uh, the men of that church made the mistake of going out and buying a carpet. And uh, in 18 years I was there, I never heard the end of it. So, uh, so as we examine Romans 14, we see that Paul is addressing indeed an age-old age problem and one that is still with us today. Christians who disagree on minor issues, but insist on dogmatically trying to change each other. It is a problem with an attitude that says, God is clearly pleased with me. God is clearly pleased with my beliefs. He is clearly pleased with my lifestyle. But those Christians over there, they are wrong. This one has the wrong view of spiritual gifts. That one drinks beer and plays cards. That one wears too much makeup and goes out dancing. And on it goes an endless list of taboos and no-nos. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here. I don't want any of you to go home and say, the pastor says anything goes. That is not the case. There are certainly doctrinal hills that sincere Christians have to be willing to die on. 
But when we as believers start arguing, even causing church splits over minor issues, we're in the danger of dishonoring God in front of a non-believing public. And we certainly are taking our eyes off the cross. So Romans 14, verses 1 through 3, but as always, before we go to Scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I lift this time up to you. And as always, it's my earnest prayer that you would just set me aside and speak through me. We thank you, Father, for these words that you have given us, how direct they are to the church. How much they talk about our responsibility to each other, how our love for each other has to be first and foremost. Father. So please, guide us and direct us as we go through these verses. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with just the first verse here. <clears throat> now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on him. <coughs> and there's a little clarification I want to make. I'm reading from the NASB. If some of you might be following along in another translation, and particularly if you're in the NIV, the NIV, that first verse reads, except him whose faith is weak, as opposed to the NAS, which says, except the one weak in the faith. You see a little subtle difference there? Faith is weak as opposed to weak in the faith. Now, uh, I would submit that the NAS in this case is, is a little more accurate with weak in the faith. It's a distinction that may seem minor, but it does have, it does have some importance. Paul is not talking here about people whose individual faith is weak. He's not talking about people who are, who are troubled, who have questions, who have doubts. We all go through those periods. He's talking about someone that has not yet matured in their understanding or their experience in the Word of God. You know, Jesus himself told us that if we were really his disciples, we must hold to his teachings, and then we will know the truth, and the truth will set us, through, set us free. In other words, a person must hold to the teachings of Christ over time. We must not be satisfied with the little that we know, but we must continually grow in knowledge and experience of truth. And folks, that is a growth, that is a maturity, a maturing, excuse me, that will continue our entire life. And you know what I'm going to tell you. You know what I'm going to tell you. Read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. And before you open it, pray. Pray for the revelation of the Holy Spirit. But understand that Paul is saying that a believer may be considered weak in faith even if he or she has a very strong, vibrant, personal faith. And once that person becomes strong in faith, he or she will understand Christian liberty and be set free. So Paul says, accept the brother or sister who is weak in faith and do so not necessarily to straighten out your fellow Christian with regard to minor issues, but simply to show him or her the same love that God has shown you through Jesus Christ. The first words exchanged between you and a fellow believer should not be a dispute, but a recognition that you belong to one another in the body of Christ. See, there are two major distortions that can hinder the unity of the body, that is the church. And they're the flip side of the same coin. One is professing Christians who continue in willful sin. The other is legalism. Legalism binds the freedom that grace gives. Legalism makes minor matters into the test of true spirituality. You may have encountered Christians who say the essence of spirituality is to refrain from such things, again, as dancing, alcohol, or movies. The creed becomes, touch not, taste not, handle not. People substitute minor matters for the fruit of the Spirit, and they use adherence to those minor matters 
as a test of righteousness. Either distortion, either far side of the spectrum, either willful sin or legalism can cause problems in the Christian life. You see, simply we find in Scripture things which God has definitely said yes and he's definitely said no. But between these matters of law, there is a host of things in the New Testament that have been described as morally neutral. And Christians need to stop passing judgment on fellow Christians when it comes to these morally neutral or disputable matters. Too often there is a spirit of rejection instead of acceptance within the church. The basic issue is that some Christians, this is important, if you're not, if you have not matured, if you don't know your Bible all that well, it is difficult to distinguish between matters of basic principle and matters of individual preference. The weak, as Paul describes that describes them, do not know when they are in an area of disputable issues or when they are in an area of indisputable issues. Again, traditionally, these have been called matters of conscience. A matter of conscience is a practice about which God has not specifically spoken in his word. Something he has not clearly forbidden, something that he has not clearly commanded. So it is possible to move into one or two of these extremes, and both are wrong when it comes to these disputable matters. But there's a caution here too, folks. And there's a caution that requires discernment, it requires some Bible knowledge, and it certainly requires prayer. We must guard against thinking that almost every area is a disputable matter of conscience. And likewise, we must guard against the view that hardly any area is a disputable matter of conscience. Look down at verse 2. Let's look at verse 2 and 3. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Well, let's start off with a little clarification right off the bat. Paul is not taking exception or disputing with vegetarians. Paul's concern here is about the moral and spiritual issues that had arisen from the Jewish character of the early church. The Jews, the Jews observed restrictions regarding eating various kinds of meat. According to the dietary laws that you can find in the book of Le Leviticus, the Jews could not eat pork. And even beef and lamb had to be prepared and killed in very specific ways. So the Jewish Christians, now that they had converted to Christianity, they had a great struggle. They had emotional difficulty in eating meat. In the Greek and Roman cities, in their culture, the issue of eating meat was complicated by the fact that much of the meat had been offered to pagan idols before, before it was sold to the public. Some Christians believed then that eating meat uh, was the equivalent of participating in idol worship. Other Christians said no, meat is meat, and the fact that someone else offered this meat as an idol doesn't mean that I am an idolater. So we have these two viewpoints. We have the very narrow and we have the very broad. As Christians, we don't deal with these issues of meat sacrificed to idols anymore, but that's actually beside the point. The principle Paul urges us to adopt is valid through all time and in an endless variety of situations. Whenever two believers find themselves on opposite sides of an issue, that one that is not clearly addressed in Scripture, then Christian love must prevail. In our own culture, the issue may have to do 
with whether it is not whether it is right for a Christian to drink wine or beer, whether Christians should support military action or be pacifists, whether Christians should adopt this or that position on baptism or eschatology, and you can probably think of other issues from your own experience. Of course, some of these are absolutely not debatable because they are clearly addressed in Scripture. Whether or not it is permissible for a Christian to drink beer or wine, it is always wrong for a Christian to be drunk because Scripture tells us that in no uncertain terms. It is always wrong to commit sexual acts. It is always wrong to hold a doctrinal view that violates Scripture, such as a belief that the Bible is not the inspired Word of God, or perhaps a belief that Jesus was not born of a virgin and he was not raised from the dead. Those folks are doctrinal hills that we must die on. But there again are many areas of scripture that are left open and unaddressed. It's kind of interesting. If the Apostle Paul would have wanted to have given a firm yes or no answer to these issues, he could have done so right here in this passage. He could have settled these issues for all time, but he doesn't do so. And you know why he doesn't do so? Because God himself did not do so. There are areas that God deliberately leaves to individual discretion. He expects believers to thoughtfully and prayerfully consider the issue, weigh the moral pros and cons, and then act in accordance with their individual convictions. And you know, a thought on those individual convictions, folks, on these minor things, If the Holy Spirit has really directed you, convinced you that that is what you should do, that is what you should observe, then do it. Then by all means, do it. We might have a conversation. I might have a different opinion on it. But if you have been convicted that this is what God would have you do, then do it. The other thing I got to thinking about our Wednesday night Bible study. I find these debatable issues to make Bible studies interesting. I do. Because they should drive you deeper into prayer, deeper into your Bible study. Leon has been leading our Bible study, I, man, I mean a long time. Ten years, Leon, maybe? I don't know. It's been a long time. And sometimes, Leon and I have differing opinions on these debatable issues. I feel sorry for Leon being wrong. <laughs> no, actually, over the years, I have changed my mind on some of these issues. But it's interesting. It makes you go back to Scripture. It makes you go to prayer, or at least it should. If you read through the Bible one time and you had it and it was done, the temptation would be, why do it again? Book. I find something new in there every time I go through it. But folks, you can read the Bible until the cows come home. But if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, His Holy Spirit indwelling you is not going to reveal to you the nuggets of truth that you're going to find in that Word. So it all starts there. And I hope you've done it. And I hope you're absolutely sure of that salvation. If you're not, I would love to talk to you about it. I'm going to ask that you continue to pray for revival. Pray that it could start right here in this church body, in this community. If you've picked an individual or a group to pray for, please continue to do that. Heavenly Father, again, I thank you so much for this body of believers. I just thank you for their willingness to serve you in this community and, and even through mission efforts, Father, to the ends of the world. And I just pray that they would continue to have those hearts for evangelism, for discipleship. And again, Father, I thank you for each and every one of them and ask your blessing on each person and family represented here today. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is the first Sunday of the month, so we're going to... Uh,
have our communion. And I'm going to ask uh, Chuck with you and Leon and Raj. Would you come up and give me a hand, please?